so yeah I believe uh, all white people are narcissists and psychopaths um, I think they're so my my brother's two children are psychopaths already and it's a real disease that people can have you know it's a real disease you should have more compassion for them than I think more people have like that means that white people deserve even more compassion than they're getting and they're getting more compassion than anyone is getting and more patience every day because it takes a lot of patience for people who aren't psychopaths to live around white people white people don't realize how costly they are they're so busy telling other people how costly they are and how difficult it is to live in the world with people like that they'd rather get rid of homeless people than raise children that aren't psychopaths the thought of populating a child with or a world with psychopaths doesn't bother them what bothers them is poor people like me that bothers them because that's something that they can express their need for control upon and objectify and they could feel like they know things in their mind about other people you ever listen to white people's ideas about humanity and philosophy and the earth and how discombobulated it all is if they even form those opinions to begin with because their conversations are pretty much like that of a bar room right and where do white people go to bars so they can act like children and practice becoming adults so they act like children they destroy their brain function and learn things that they need to learn to become an adult which is ratified by the religion of being an adult that is incorporated into the religion of being a white person it doesn't actually mean anything not anything good unless of course you're one of them and you speak their language so it's like a very preferential way of talking about and to other creatures right I made a video about these serious public health concerns and within a minute of the last video the appendix being put online a white person made a comment joking about all human suffering that I'm describing complete sadistic the first thing they will say is sadistic ambivalence to other creatures and myself that's the first comment the first comment after a minute putting up these health issues the first comment from a white person declaring sadistic ambivalence to everyone connected to these massive health issues okay that's white people you see they don't have any empathy right their brains don't work properly it's unfair to expect them to right and I don't want to be unfair I don't have any expectations of white people being mentally healthy human beings just like when you drive down the road and expect that everyone's a crazy person that's how I live my life around white people right? I'm a defensive liver they have to be narcissists right they have to be they have virtually no choice it's the only way to become an adult narcissist can say like a psychopath the most scathing humiliating things to another person and say it's just a joke or I didn't mean it get over it it gives them a, a lot of power over other human beings who are more intelligent and sensitive than they are and so they basically rule the world by force by humiliation and dominance and territory and hordes of them and groups of them you see any group of white people they're a sexually predatory force in any community every time whether they work at mental health or any white people like to help people because they put them in contact with vulnerable people on whom they can project their own pathology and among groups of them they will pathologize particular types of children and vulnerable people they always will they'll manipulate they'll lie they'll objectify and if you ever say anything it's like wow we're doing so much how could you possibly criticize us you can't criticize them they can never do anything wrong does it sound familiar it's kind of like this book over here right right it's about what white people it's about people with a god complex 
white people all have a narcissistic God complex. It's built into their whole lives. It's built into their personalities, their libido, right? They have to be able to have children, even though they don't give a shit about other life forms, right? So, and that's fine for them. But if you're not a narcissist and you're around them, be warned, right? Right? Not all is as it seems. Not all that glitters white is good. Not all that is white is good. A lot of that lack of melatonin is a lack of basic brain function. So let's ask about the brain function of the white people and go to their number one holy book, right? Observed by billions of white people over the last thousand years. Okay? The perfect, uncriticizable, completely pristine word of the God. Instructions for the priests. The Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the deceased, the priests, the descendants of Aaron, the deceased, essentially. A priest must not make himself ceremony un unclean by touching the dead body of a relative. Wow, we're already talking about death. The only exceptions are his closest relatives, his mother or father, son or daughter, brother or his virgin sister who depends on him because she has no husband. Wow. Right? Here, introducing the word virgin, right? We haven't seen that yet. This is Leviticus chapter 21. A virgin isn't necessarily someone who doesn't have sex, by the way. In this case, it's someone who doesn't have a husband. But everyone in the Bible is a virgin because a Messiah is a virgin. A soul is a virgin. It's someone whose sexual organs and whose connection to life through gender is collapsed into the operation of organs that are designed to deliver and manage waste products, which is what all other biological organs are converted into when God creates the earth as a dead body. <coughs> right? And he's the number one waste product. And he's like death, and he organizes everything according to death. But a priest must not defile himself and make himself unclean for someone who is related to him only by marriage. What the fuck is that? The priest must not shave their heads or trim their beards or cut their bodies. They must be set apart as holy to their God and must never bring shame on the name of God. They must be holy, for they are the ones who present the special gifts to the Lord, gifts of food for their God. Food for their God. Priests may not marry a woman defiled by prostitution, and they may not marry a woman who is divorced from her husband, for the priests are set apart as holy to their God. You must treat them as holy because they offer up food to your God. You must consider them holy because I, the Lord, am holy, and I make you holy. If a priest's daughter defiles herself by becoming a prostitute, well, okay, how often is that happening? She, right, giving herself to another God, maybe? She also defiles her father's holiness, and she must be burned to death. Ah, that's what I always do when my daughters have sex with someone. I burn them to death. Mm. Because God's libido is the libido of death. You burn and burn. Come on, baby, light my fire. This is the end. My only friend, the end, right? The high priest has the highest rank of all the priests. The anointing oil has been poured on his head. That's the oil of Christ. And he has been ordained to wear the priestly garments. He must never leave his hair uncombed or tear his clothing. He must not defile himself by going near a dead body. Didn't we already cover this? He may not make himself ceremonially unclean, because basically everyone is a dead body in God's world, okay? He must not get close to you in that way, right? Unless, of course, they buy an indulgence, right? It's amazing, like in white TV shows, when somebody dies, they always like to have sex because it reminds them of being alive and associating sex with death, right? When you, because everything's and everyone's dead, right? Sex is the only thing that can give two dead people a feeling of real life. You know, it's almost like you were dead before I met you and you brought me to life. You brought me to life again, and you've touched my body. And I, my river is flowing between my legs. You have brought fertility to my groin-like kingdom. He may not make himself ceremonial unclean, even for his father or mother. 
What does that mean? He must not defile the sanctuary of his God by leaving it to attend to a dead person, for he has been made holy by the anointing oil of his God, which is basically there so he can attend to God's version of dead people. It's all doublespeak. The high priest may marry only a virgin. He may not marry a widow, a woman who is divorced, or a woman who has defiled herself by prostitution. What does that make a virgin? Someone who's not a prostitute. Okay? Which is pretty much what marriage is. Okay? It's all the same thing. She must be a virgin from his own clan. Wow, from his own family. So that he will not dishonor his descendants among his clan. For I am the Lord who makes him holy. Right, an organ for my waste products. The first word of the Bible is the letter zero. The number six, which means yes. And then you've got N and E in the number one, which is five five. Six five five, which makes eleven eleven, or six ten, or sixteen or seven. And ten and five five is ten, which is two. And six and two is eight, which is the number of the Bible. And if you take the number zero as zero, you just get five five, which is ten, which is both one and two. One or one one. And one x negative one is one. But zero can also be one or negative one, or it can be one one. So a lot of different aspects of one and combinations of one come out of absolute nothing. Nothing and one. So how do you become one? You become more and more given over to the language of white society, and you become nothing. And by becoming nothing, you become anything you need to be. And when you become anything to me, the only way to do that is to have become as though nothing. And to become more capable of eliminating the spirit of other creatures and people. It's a dislocation or disjunctioning of the functions of the brain. In both feeling and thought. It's immoral. It's how to make people immoral. It's how to make them psychopaths and narcissists. People with God complexes. What is a God complex? Someone who thinks like God does. So worshiping God as a supernatural being pre prevents white people from being properly diagnosed as a race, as a race of insane people, being kept in bay by their own political systems and problems and crimes. White people aren't fit to live in a peaceful world. They fucking cannibalize each other. Right? We need governments and order and pain and crime to keep give them something to do. You know, we want white people to be busy. We don't want them thinking too much. You know, they, they have a Santa Claus state of mind for everything in life. They believe everything their governments or their God tells them. They never question anything. I've talked to some pretty severe white narcissists, and they'll waste your time for years. It's all about them, constantly. They need so much attention. I've met white engineers that just need constant amounts of attention when you're around them. Getting attention, getting attention, even though they're able to be engineers. 
I've met more than one engineer, male and female, who are narcissistic sexual predators. I can think of three off the top of my head. Four, now that I think of it. I mean, it's just like, wow. You know? So I, I want to understand, I want to appreciate and respect, and understand that white society is based on a lot of lying, a lot of posturing, a lot of territory, and a lot of what could seem like massive amounts of narcissism and psychopathy. White culture has all that, needs all of that, or could be misinterpreted or interpreted correctly as that. All those things are possible. I was walking down the coast and a white man, I thought it was a woman, was being territorial. And I thought, oh shit, you're scared, you're scared, aren't you? They're way, way far away and they see me, I could tell it's a problem. So they go sit down and as I get closer, it's a man and I guess, I don't, maybe he realized I was a man, I don't know, and started walking towards me. And I just ignored him and then he turned and walked another way. It was just really weird, really awkward. And it's like, you can tell that they're tethered to you, and meaning uh, that they're fashioning their plan about their bodily movements based on a sense of fear or trepidation about your existence um, in a similar environment to them. And you'd be surprised how many white people do this, unbeknownst to most people, and you can feel it, right? Especially if you're the only two people in the landscape, right? It's, it's, I don't call it stalking so much as tethering, because I feel like I have some role in that, and I try to you know, disjoint, disjoint my, and just, you know, pretend like nothing's happening. You see, that's what I've done all my life since I was a child around white people. Depend like nothing's happening. Pretend like nothing's happening. Even though they do and say all kinds of crazy shit all the time. Pretend like nothing's happening. You have to suspend disbelief to talk to white people and to live around them. It's incredible. You know, imagine how much healthier they could be if they just decided to become honest one day. You know? They shouldn't be diagnosing anyone with mental disorders, let me tell you. You saw on that website that, that male, when I've said that I, I told them that I identify as a female, and I got a female thing, and I told them that I was a schizophrenic, and they immediately want to put me into a psychiatrist and pay more money, right? Because already they're suggesting that there's something wrong with the idea of me seeking talk therapy with a regular clinician, right? They don't, they don't want to talk to schizophrenics right away. Right? They know if you've been diagnosed by schizophrenia, they can get more money off of you, they can prescribe drugs maybe, you know, all kinds of things. You're more of a hot ticket. Right? You're not worth talking to. They've already disabled you. They've already eliminated. That, that email was him eliminating me emotionally as a human being in the name of schizophrenia. He wouldn't have sent that message if I didn't say I was schizophrenic. That's why I do, to test people. You see everything right there. Right? How do you know I'm not misdiagnosed? Why are you why are you stalking me? Why does he why does he why did he say that it's nice of them, like sociopathic white people, to let me know that he's stalking me and that he's overseeing my relationship with a woman I've never met. And I could ask, who else is overseeing this, this private network? Who else has access to this? You know, tell me about all all the other little little details in this contract. Who else gets to see this? You know, why you see what they you know, white people, how they expect you to be stupid. I mean, you have to be fucking stupid and vulnerable to, to contract with these fucking people. I'd never get therapy with a white person. They're useless. They're fucking useless. They can't get out of the way of themselves, for Christ's sake. Nobody should have taught them psychology ever. Or let them read a Bible. They're fucking insane. Like, just, oh wow, I just saw a light. Beautiful. Thank you. Red and yellow just going off into those mountains. They're just fucking insane. I mean, it's crippling. It's fucking crippling. I can't imagine how their children deal with this. It's fucking crippling. And how white people all know how to deal with their children. They know everything about everything, you know? It's like it's all like a world of acting. They don't give a fuck about living creatures, ever. They just don't. And why? Because they tell me that all the time. One white woman interrupted me talking to the one nice man I met on the trail to tell us about how she hated growing salad leaves. And she hates her lessons plant and how she doesn't want to grow it anymore and it sucks. And then wants to talk about other things she hates and watching men getting tortured on Netflix and how she's glad that her grandson's uh, dog died. And then, but you know, apparently so did the grandson, but she calls it her daughter's son and how they're so glad the dog died, you know, and, 
and it's just like it goes on and on and on and then you get near the end of the conversation and you're like oh i um i've been watching something on cbc oh, what's that and you can see the look in their eyes or bbc that is like they just oh this is the time when they do their brain is just unconscious now because they've been doing their thing for 15 20 minutes they can't possibly listen to anything you have to say because they're in a trance right they're not even connected to you in any way whatsoever and they've done this their whole lives and they get together with other white women and they drink and they watch men being tortured on Netflix. Ha 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 ha. You know, it's just, it's just disgusting. It's just absolutely, white, white, I've had white landlords, you know, females, you know, just disgusting liars. Just this filthy, disgusting liars. And they treat other people like animals. They treat their friends like animals. They treat other women like farm animals, for Christ's sake. You know, they're great at managing people. They'd be great fucking for Noah's Ark, gathering people and farm animals into the fucking Ark uh, to Noah's Ark. They're really good at biblical scale of operation. I think white people would be at their best if aliens took over the world and everything became some, some giant crisis. That's when they're at their best. Right? Psychopaths and narcissists love crisis. There's not, they fucking sit there and fucking enjoy the fuck out of themselves. They feed off of it. They feed off of human fear, and, you know? They find careers around it, for Christ's sake. I've been in hospitals where, you know, young white males, they're not happy enough with the injuries they have. They have to fucking wait till I come out of anesthetic, anesthesiologist, and then sexually assault me as I'm just waking up. And you know, you know as soon as they come into the room, before they even put you in, you know exactly what kind of psychopath they are. Why? Because the female nurses think you're hot. And now it's stirred up their territorial problems. they got to make sure they put you in your place. Everything in the white world has to be in its place. You can't talk out of place. Oh no, you're a schizophrenic. No, we can't give you regular therapy. we got to put nudge you towards a psychiatrist. You might have special needs. Schizophrenics don't need, you know, they don't know what they need. We've got to help you. We've got to supervise your choices as an adult male. That's amazing. Let me talk to my mom first. Thank you very much. Why, white people, do you have to stalk your patients in order to help them? Are you so fucking full of shit? You're so fucking lonely? You're so fucking decrepit in your fucking brain function? So many fucking parasites in your fucking blood that your life isn't enough for you? You gotta fucking stalk people paying you money and telling you their most vulnerable problems? You fucking ugly cunts. But of course you're white, so I forgive you. You're white. You're white. Well, Stupid me, you're white. I shouldn't have, what am I saying? What am I doing? Complaining about white people. What a useless thing to do, right? The one white man I had to go by yesterday going home, he's a psychopath that lives in the building, him and his wife. They've openly admitted to stealing things and they've lied about it and they use people. They've admitted to that. That's just normal for them, right? My mom and I, who do nothing, have had notices posted around the building making us feel unsafe living there for minor infractions, <laughs> for slander, for the suggestion of impropriety. Meanwhile, a white whore prostitute lived and worked down the hall for like six years without complaint. You see what I mean? Hmm, think about it. And everybody knew. But she's a homeowner. Let white people, here's my advice to you, put up signs. They love signs. Let them put up signs <laughs> about you anywhere, anytime. Whatever makes them safe, and then you work around that. White society is all the creepy shit that make white people feel safe. And then once they have what they need, then try to eke out some place in the world safe from them. Because my safety doesn't mean anything to a white person. It's the safety of them. It's nothing to do with my safety ever. I've got to make them feel safe. Hmm? And now and then their women like to show me their vaginas and they want me to stick my penis in it. So I'm good for that too, apparently. So what else does that leave me mm, to do today? Mm, it's like, I, what would I do with a mind that isn't just a talking penis for white women? It's so difficult to figure that out. What should I do, God? 
Let's check the Bible. <laughs> what should I do? Christians want my soul, and white women want my dick. And some of the white men, too. So it's like, hmm. It says here, teaching about prayer. Jesus visits Martha and Mary. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha, my grandmother's name, welcomed him into her home. Oh, big mistake. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. Sat at his feet. Can you imagine that? But Martha was distracted by the big, wait for it, dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, remember he's a stranger in their house, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. <laughs> yeah, of course, like, you never want to think about details when it comes to God, eh? Yeah, lawyers do, but not Christians. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. <gasps> Look, that's a complete narcissist right there. That's a complete narcissist. Absolute fucking narcissist. Unless he's a fictional character making some other type of ethereal point. That is a narcissist. Anyone, the more real he becomes, the more narcissistic he would have to become. And that's how white people are born. They're born out of fiction, into reality, becoming increasingly narcissistic, but in any other fiction in which they live, that's the last thing they could possibly be. They're the tip of the sword. 99% fiction and 1% pure fucking unadulterated narcissism. <laughs> right? Right here. That's someone with a God complex. Right? Teaching about prayer, chapter 11. Now, Luke, chapter 11. That was the verse before. Once Jesus was in a certain place praying, as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Mm. Jesus said, this is how you should pray, colon. Father, may your name be kept holy. We learned earlier that God is very holy. He makes everyone else holy. He's so holy, he can decide who else is holy. And whether or not their, you know, their discharges have made them unclean and who to sleep with. You ever had a cult leader? There was a Qigong school whose white cult leader was telling the women who and who not to sleep with. And that he knew more about sex than they did. It's amazing what you can get for $150 a month. And yet they're the most humble people in the world. Their students have pictures of them. Beautiful, clean Qigong. <laughs> right? Father, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. Oh, okay. Like, that's going to be good. Give us each day the food we need. Okay, so apparently God gives us our food. So again, like Whitman, he's taking control of the entire earth. He is in the name of all the earth and all the mother, because that's where food comes from, the mother, right? Give us each day the food we need. Because his kingdom's not even here, but we're hoping he gives us all of our food. But his kingdom is not here. It's elsewhere. Okay. But he's kind of like taking care of us while his kingdom, which is probably more important, is going on. And forgive us our sins, which is death, which is everything that God gives you to live your life. As we forgive those who sin against us, right? Which means that we have basically a monetary libido for each other. So sex, everything in love is now converted into a monetary relationship, because that's what that is. Forgiving each other is having a monetary relationship applied to any and all relationships. That's why a Christians will say to me, you should forgive your father. That's saying that our whole relationship is comprehended by the currency of how God redeems sin, which is debt and death. So even though his kingdom is really far away, he seems to know a lot about economics. Okay, And don't let us yield to temptation. So we should allow ourselves to yield to this indefatigable narcissism that converts our pain, humiliation, and flesh and blood into nothing more than an, an economic system. Uh, but we shouldn't yield to temptation. What other temptation could there be? There's, I mean, there's, you're dead at that point, right? There are no types. Like, you, we won't be able to, because what's left? This is the ultimate temptation. It's the forbidden fruit. Then teaching them more about prayer or preying on each other, right, like narcissist, he used this story. Suppose you went to a friend's house, which is a fiend's house, at midnight, wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. You say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit, and I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me, the door is locked for the night. 
and my family and I are all in bed. I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. And so I tell you, keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Shameless persistence. Fascinating. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. Even if not out of friendship. Right? For everyone who asks, receives. You know, They want you to bang down the door for God's fucking cock up your ass. And all of his food. Right? Learning his food. That's what children do in high school. They learn how to knock on the door to get God's food, which is each other's bodies, right? That's why as a white person learns to have sex, they learn to work and get married, you know? They know all of that by the time they're 12 years old. It's all part of the libido of the whole culture. It teaches you to be a worker. The whole culture is about work and sex and death, right? And taxes. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? You know, it couldn't possibly be a bad thing. It will give you something really, like, so that's the food. The food of the Holy Spirit. The food that the priests offer to Him. The Holy Spirit. And Christians don't believe that anything has a spirit, except God. So, how do you give... How does he give us the Holy Spirit? Where does he get that from? He's got so much of it to give away that you should be begging him for it, along with all the other food that God alone can give you, while commending your bodies and those of your mother to the currency of a purely economic form of prostitution and trafficking. And trafficking even while you sympathize with any and all of the humil humiliations of the man around you and the suffering of the world so that you can deal with it, but also traffic in it at the same time. And I mean, I tell you that white people love to be around vulnerable people while they're doing their job and while they're helping God traffic in human suffering. Like very deeply ensconced narcissists. Right? Christian soldiers, if you will. Who speak the language of the dead. You know? Haley Joel Osment says, I see dead people with his sixth sense. Which is like saying yes twice. It's like saying yes, yes. Wee oui, wee. Oui. We want what you're offering. If you can just see dead people, Haley Joel Osment, then I want to watch this movie and find out about the dead people you can see. Maybe I'll learn more about God's Holy Spirit because it's the spirit of the dead. And he will give us that spirit even as he feeds us what? The food of the dead. And what is the dead? The food of other people. And look at how voracious white people are for your celestial and emotional auras. Constantly feeding on something that they can't even use. And because they're not using it, they're feeding on what you have of it. And will always have to. And whatever they get from you, they will never get everything they want. And they can hold that against you, just like God does, because they have a God complex. So a lot of white parents exert this God complex and this feeding frenzy in the name of anything that the left part of their brain can offer up or is learned to over their own flesh and blood. That's called raising a child to make them a good worker. Right? A good fucker. Because their libido is their workforce. So when white people learn sexual function, it's about working. Learning to work and learning to have sex and have a girlfriend and boyfriend is a part of the same process. It's done at the same time under the same institutional circumstance. And it often involves alcohol. So that in itself tells you something. Learning the major things in life that your brain will ever need to do to whatever end or circumstance or impact while consuming what an embalming fluid that that is used by dead people or when you're dying alcohol is traditionally used for people who are if are in a lot of pain or dying soldiers 
and look at who's using it, white people, because it's good for them for the same reason. They're living in the land of death. How do soldiers fuck when they're on leave? It becomes a compliment to war. It becomes a compliment to combat, right? Look at male fantasies in the white movies, right? Combat, fucking sex, combat, death, fucking sex, combat, fuck death, sex, fuck combat, right? You killed this, I'm killing you, I'm having sex with her, and she can't have sex with you because you're busy saving the world, right? The, the libido is triangulated with the entire song or plot of, of the deus ex machina or the death spasms of all the movies, right? When white people have sex, their orgasm is that of them coming back to life and dying at the same time. It's a, it's a borderline state, right? They're trying to recreate the universe. They're trying to get their minds going again. It's like a jump start. That's why they have sex when people die, so they can feel what life feels like at the doorway of death that's closest to them, because their sex is always flirting with death. Their libido is that of a mind divided against itself. Something's already died in their mind as they're developing the interest in objectifying other people's bodies and turning that into romance and love and a job and a marriage, right? And when they walk by me on the trail, these white men just humiliated their wives in front of me, right? It's, all, it's kind of a show. It kind of excludes you, as white people do, and it's willing to at least give a preponderance of the suggestion that they're domestically abusing their wives in order to do so. And the wives gluntonly take it as if to say, yeah, yeah, all right, well, let's keep going. <laughs> They're married, they have good government jobs, they have children, they have homes and mortgages and cars and everything else. But what are they? Children. That's right. Like in any cult, especially with alcohol and drugs, as white people age, they basically freeze in time. They're like a frozen caveman. The narcissist for himself, his, you can see that their brain has always been frozen. It's always frozen. It's always frozen in a certain way of operation since they're an infant, much less an adolescent. I mean, it, it, you know, it's certainly like if you were playing a video game and you had to choose an arc of root to adulthood that was very concentrated but could eliminate, like evolution, millions of other parallel possibilities of, of existence, then that would be it. And you'd be very strong in that, very specialized in that way. It'd be like the Arc de Triomphe, and you'd be like standing with a, with a torch, you know? Like, like, like Nike or Psyche, and just going, yay. <laughs> you know, you're ready to, to row the canoe of society then. And you'll be the best rower there is. They can put you in different positions. They can train you. They can cross-train you. You can help build the ship. You can learn about the stars and guide the ship. You can do anything. A man and a woman for all occasions. With a God complex. Because what it takes out of them, it can take out of you. What if you haven't given away what they've given away? What if it still means something to you? How does that feel? You know, I've already had one white male tethered to me today so far. I thought it was this other male stalker. And I thought it was a woman to start off with, which I find with a lot of white people you know, even though people have different genders, that I, I often misgender them from a distance. It's very hard to tell. The behavior sometimes is so similar, like a uniform hieroglyphic, right? That the male and female energy is so unable to conceal its uh, feeling about me approaching on the beach. You know, at first they, they sort of hide away, and then they approach me too aggressively. It's just so inelegant. almost like it's designed to trip me up. It'd be like me, like if I thought someone was the least bit concerned about me and somehow finding a way to get as close to them as possible. You know, if you think there's an issue, why would you do that? So I know the person feels like there could be an issue, then why would you approach me like that? Why not say hello? You know, and it's like, 
white people approach everyone with fear. It's just out here, they can't control it as much. That's all. You're just out here. You see a certain side to the people that come out here on vacation, a certain side to white people. You can study like as someone working in a medical clinic, people come here and they're sick and I can see how they are. And sure, I'm, I'm not, I'm seeing them when they're on vacation, but I'm seeing them also at their worst, the crap coming out of them, you know? I mean, a million things could contribute to that, of course. A million, million things that are none of my business, and you know? But that's, that's, how it, that's how it meets me. That's what I learn, and I have to develop a resistance to that. I'm of no use to them, right? It's interesting, I met these white people from uh, the United States, and this, you know, their dog was too barky. They're very white, but they, they were nice, but still white. And so even nice white people are difficult to be around. And uh, it was sunny, and the woman said, um, you know, isn't this the Sunshine Coast? I guess it's supposed to be sunny here. And I said, well, you just caught us on a good day. And that's all I said. It's been, you know, so they picked a good time and all that. But the Sunshine Coast is actually very far from here. You know, um, it's a very distinct area, which someone from, I asked her where she came from, would probably know, especially if you were traveling in the region. It's like every map in letters, any map you can get of BC says Sunshine Coast, so where it is and what, what area that is. So like, you wouldn't, if you were traveling to the Sunshine Coast, you wouldn't come to Parksville, <laughs> okay? This is not within the region of the Sunshine Coast at all, do you understand? It's like 100 and 150 miles away, okay? So it's nice, on the one hand, it's like a compliment. She's including me from a very rich, gentrified part of, of Washington, um, the Olympic Peninsula, and she's applying what makes sense to them, their Canadian counterparts would basically be the Sunshine Coast. That's where a lot of rich white people like them live and retire, right? So that makes sense. It's not here, and anyone with a brain can see that. So the fact that she's even mentioned the Sunshine Coast, that she's basically extrapolating this place into it, uh, is really interesting. It's really interesting. And then, for some reason, she starts talking about how, you know, she said, says that they come out here because, you know, they're, they live in a nice area and everything, but, you know, they're so busy and stuff, it's just nice to get away. Which, although I know white people do that, I said it on my YouTube video this week, that they live lives that they have to escape. You know? <laughs> that they have to go really far from their homes and take a vacation because their whole life is a job. Okay? And they work while they're on vacation. My sister does the same thing. Okay? So, you know. And you kind of have to do that to be successful. I, I get it. But you understand, like, but I'm describing the way of life here. Right? Not the way it's not always nice to see it, but the way it is. Because the way a clinician looks at the human body, you don't see it. Like, you could say, hey, Rain, you're okay. You look okay, you look okay. But what if, like, you have internal damage, right? People can be okay and have internal damage. People can work and work too hard. People can, you know, a lot of things. I'm not a, an expert. I'm not a medical intuitive. But I'm just, I'm thinking for all of us, when you meet anyone in a, you know, on vacation, there's like, you can assume or not you can have empathy that maybe there is a lot going on here that this woman is telling me quite a bit in a fairly abbreviated way thank you we need to get away but also doing something although i take her at her honesty because i know it's true but just like the dog the dog barking and then she spends a lot of time telling me why the dog's barking and how okay it really is and i spend the entire time telling her i'm okay with it and it's not a problem and that long after the dog has settled down she's still explaining it and i have to sort of interrupt her and say yeah i do thank you i appreciate that i you know, your insight on that, I, I agree. You know, it's a pretty good description of what's happening. It's a border collie and he's you know, going into his instinct or her instinct to, uh, to um, what's the word? Rustle you, I guess. Herd you, you know, trying to herd you. And uh, okay, you know, okay, good, sure. And it's like unnecessary barking unnecessary intent on justifying, justifying where she's on vacation, confusing the area, or purposely confusing the area, you know, that's fine itself, um, and then telling me that, you know, the reason why 
she even still has to work. So justifying that, uh, because she hasn't, she won't get her health care otherwise if she retires too early. Uh, at first she says she doesn't have health care, and I said, oh, you know, hope, hope that you know, you deserve everything you need health wise. You know, I'm, I'm sure, I'm, I'm glad you're healthy and all that. And she says, and after I've done that, she says, oh, I just need to work a few more years so that my job will give me health insurance. Right? Okay, so now I've met them, and two and a half, three and a half minutes has gone by all about them, all about explaining and defending why they're there and starting with why their dog is being aggressive to me. That's a lot of information for, you know, and I, I, you know, and I just say, enjoy your evening, you know, and your peace and so forth. Thank you. Okay, we go on. But essentially, at that point, her dog had bothered me twice. Once when I was sitting there again, and it's fine, you know, because dogs are dogs, and I like animals, and I told them that, and they said, yeah, they're the best, and at least that connected. See, with, like, narcissists, at least, like, like, psychopaths are really good with animals, and it's like, that's the best way to connect to white people is through their animals. That's the first time their emotions actually clicked in, the whole time we talked. I said, oh, I love dogs. I love animals. You know? When I was talking about something to do with me, about another border collar that I meet that I was saying barks a lot louder, so your dog is really quite gentle by comparison, there's no response to this information. Nothing. Like, you might as well be talking to a wall. Like, psychopaths, they don't even listen to you, right? But when I said, oh, I love dogs, they're like, yeah, aren't they great? <laughs> now you're speaking our language. <laughs> you know, it's like, aren't they wonderful? And then saying, oh, yours is particularly, you know, oh, oh yes, they're tricolor, you know? And then she's telling, now she's happy about that. Oh, they're tricolor. They've looked for them. And, oh, wow, amazing. You know, yeah. Max. And I don't doubt they love their dog. Um, you know, and that's great. And I, I get dog people. We've had dogs. And I do. I get all that. And that, that. The dog makes it actually a nicer experience for everyone. I'm sure, you know, I have to assume they're awkward talking to me too. So finally, we've found something interesting to talk about. The dog that's now just sitting there, you know. Hey, I'm the reason you people can even get along, <laughs> you know. It's basically, you know. And also, the reason the dog's barking at me is because she's interested in me. They're tethered to me already. They just are. And white people do that. They tether to you. Um, you know, and it's a beach and they're on vacation and you know, it's all, it's no big deal, right? It's just, you know, the tides in, what have you. And it's, uh, and they're solid people. I mean, why? I mean, they, 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 they look like healthy, solid people. But when you reflect upon the information they're sharing, I can only conclude that it's a very white interaction. It's so interesting. Instead of, it's better than me having to justify my existence. You know, they're, now they're justifying theirs. I wish they weren't. It makes me a little uncomfortable, but it's like, okay, sure, justify why you're here. Um, I, I said to them, thankful. Uh, like, your, your area is a legendary. Um, and I repeat it, like, thank you for you know, bringing yourselves here. I mean, you come from a wonderful place, and I would not want nothing more than to enjoy whatever you happen to found worth coming here for. You know, it's great, you know, uh, and so on and so on. But um, they're probably drunk, probably half in the bag, too, at the same time. You know, they're, they're probably rent. I saw where they came down. They're probably renting a local Airbnb, right? So that means you can get drunk and go down to the beach. Why would you get down to the beach without being drunk? You know, they were drunk, <laughs> you know. So white people that are drunk. And nervous, so she's doing all the talking and she's oversharing. So, and we wouldn't even be talking at all if they hadn't started talking to me. So it's like white people, they, they stop you, they insist on inciting more than the usual sort of pleasantries, but they don't really want to, and they're usually glad that you're gone. And so it's very taxing. Like, why? Why are you talking to me? Why not just enjoy your evening? They're drug addicts. Happens every year. Some class or group, these boys are higher than last year, will decide to initiate a conversation that has nothing to do with anything I need to be too concerned about. It doesn't add nor subtract from my life. Who you are, where are you from, why you're here. Don't know what the area is called. Okay, good for you. You're traveling someplace and you don't know where that is and just successful white people with millions of dollars. But you don't know that this isn't the Sunshine Coast. That's a bit, or you so don't know where you are, 
or you're so fixated in your own obsessive world that you just assume all of this is the Sunshine Coast and you've never thought about it. Because you're already going to tell your friends that you went on vacation to an Airbnb in the Sunshine Coast or, better yet, the white woman, she probably rented the Airbnb, told them that it's a lovely B&B on or near the Sunshine Coast because that's how you attract rich white people from the area because the Sunshine Coast is, is a, has a, a luster to it when people hear about it and it's well known for being an excellent place where white people live and vacation, which is not here, by the way, okay? In fact, I've never even been to the Sunshine Coast, so hello. <laughs> and it's just, I'll tell you that, if you live in the Sunshine Coast, it, it has nothing but wonderful things to say about it, but don't go there unless they approve of you, <laughs> you know? It's not me. You're not going to find me down there. Okay? These are like the whitest of the white. Jesus would call them the cream of the crop. <laughs> These people should go there. They would fit in better. But they found here instead because like a lot of these Airbnb owners lie to them. They, they spruce up their little websites. You can tell by the way they behave as to where they are and how private it's going to be. And they'll fucking attack you because of lies some white cunt told them so they could get their fucking money off of them because they don't rent it every week or every month. There's a lot of downtime. There's a lot of Airbnbs, you see. And it's a rocky, strewn, often rainy, wet, windy coast. So a lot of people don't want to fucking come here. The trails aren't clearly marked. And it's just a bunch of fucking stones and fucking barnacles. And then me walking along with my fucking backpack, screwing up your whole fucking day because they've already let you know that there are people who trespass on our properties and they're vagrant. And, you know, you have to come up to them and fucking sexually assault them. <laughs> and you can feel it. You feel it the whole time they're fucking stalking you. And I mean, I've never had a worse experience from an animal, let alone white people who spent one night at an Airbnb &E and couldn't abide the idea that someone else would be walking there because they'd been sold a place that was private, right? They were treating me walking on federal land like I had walked onto their actual property. That's exactly, they were delusional. They were delusional. And white people give each other parasites because they lie all the time to get money off of each other and they pass the buck. So instead of actually just going, taking that back, they just took it out all on me, right? The Airbnb owner is basically giving people like me as little bits of meat that these fucking psychopaths can feed on. You see what white people think of the area, the native land on which they live, who probably never actually fucking come down here themselves, much less walk miles up and down it every day. On federal land, by the way. Right? It's not like Canada doesn't have its jurisdiction over this and me and my behavior. And all the laws of Canada are in effect here. I'm not saying I'm operating on a land where I have the right to just piss on people's good day. I mean, like, I was hundreds of meters away walking at a steady pace along the tree line while they were down on the low tide. And he had to walk hundreds of meters out of his way to catch up to me, to get in a position higher to me and start physically threatening me. You understand? And when I said, excuse me, I'm just having a private walk home. That wasn't enough for him. So that's strike two, right? And it's a psychopath. And I will take this as a little arrogant little bonbon because it means nothing. Because I, you know, I had to deal with shock for several weeks. And, but it helped me understand the area a bit better because that's living around white people. And even if I lived here for 20 years, you'd still have to learn what we, kind of ways these fucking psychopaths can molest you on any given day. I mean, it's, it's less predictable than the fucking weather, but it's more inevitable than a fucking tornado in tornado land, right? It's inevitable. It's just not predictable. And uh, I actually got him to half apologize or say that he didn't mean to create, you know, fuss. But you know what I had to do? You know that the moment that changed is when I told him and pointed to where I lived, the fucking resort with the big buildings standing up in the distance. Like, then he just... Right? It's all about economics. When he wasn't able to see, and if he'd seen the little fucking condo I live in with my mom, it probably wouldn't have meant as much. But the building itself, the, the artifice that I pointed to, he immediately, you see how he, he completely fixated and decided what I was and lowered his moral and sexual inhibitions about my physical space. So a stranger walking in a land unknown to him, except maybe the two hours that he'd actually been down there and already fueled with a level of information, because he told me everything, about enough about the area to know, knowingly or knowledgeably 
accuse me of having violated various local property rights because I couldn't possibly be walking down there because he knows that there's no way to get down there. Well, it's not entirely true, but no official way to get down there. So he's got this all figured out in his mind, like the sheriff of fucking Nottingham while he's on vacation. So you see how white people fucking talk. And I know that. I know your fucking pathological gossips. You fucking throw people left and right so you can fucking feed your insatiable godlike need for acknowledgement every fucking day of your life. And you feed off each other and you feed. God gives you food. He brings food to you. Hey, Mary, you know the mess because you sit on the feet of a fucking stranger selling you on the spirit of fucking death instead of making real fucking food. No sooner do we hear about God and the food that he gives everyone to the fucking food that isn't worth eating, that of your own fucking mother, because Jesus is there fucking fawning over your adolescent sister or your daughter. It's fucking disgusting. The narcissism is beyond belief. But you see why white, it's really taken. Christianity isn't a religion I think some white people adopt. It's in their blood. It's in the language and culture. These people are all fucking Jesus. They're all fucking Saul. They're all fucking Pontius Pilate. They're all fucking Mary and Magdalene. And they're fucking the devil and God whenever the fuck they need to be. They're every character in every film and play that Gates McFadden could ever dress up and put a mask on and say, Hey, I'm better at being a human than you could ever be while I'm fucking lying to you. Because that's the power of lying. Something that white people know a lot about because they do it every fucking day of their lives. And all of their fucking relationships and all of their fucking marriages are based on fucking lies. It's a sea of fucking lies to match the sea of fucking death where Jesus swims around like fucking Poseidon looking for Ariel to go sit at his fucking feet. There's more in the libido and sexual perversions of the Western world in the Bible than in the pages of fucking Penthouse and Hustler. That's my theory. Dedicated to the human mind. Let's go. I will bring the Bible in case anyone's asking. Oh! Take a piss, take a piss, take a piss, take a piss, piss. Take a piss. Because you need to take a piss. Take a piss. Triumphant. And take a piss. You can do it. You can do it. I need to empty my bladder now. Take a piss. It will feel good. You will feel good. Take a piss. I don't think it should. I don't think it should. They won't want you. Take out your giant hose. <laughs>